Earth's climate is out of balance. We have heard this many times from climate researchers, including myself, but we rarely hear what can be done about it. In this talk, I summarize our options based on my book, The Future Climate Starts Today, which will be released in Oxford University Press in 2021. We are talking here about the balance between incoming shortwave radiation, which we all know as sunlight, and outgoing longwave radiation, or heat. We understand very well that we are in this situation because of the human-caused increase in the planet's natural greenhouse effect, mainly, but not only, because of carbon dioxide or CO2 emissions from fossil fuel burning. Now, how do we know this? Well, there are three independent lines of argument. First, fossil fuel carbon is millions of years old, and as a result, its radioactive carbon component has completely decayed away because this takes only about 50,000 years. So, when we radiocarbon date tree rings from the Industrial Revolution to the present, we find ages that appear too old. And this is because of vast amounts of carbon, old, dead fossil fuel carbon, that have been added to the atmosphere. Second, fossil fuel has a characteristic, very negative, stable carbon isotope ratio. When we measure changes in this ratio since the Industrial Revolution, we find a distinct trend to more negative values, which are caused by the fossil fuel carbon addition. And third, fossil fuels are an economic resource. They get sold and account books are kept of the quantities that are sold. And this way we know for sure that we have burned double the amount of carbon that we find in the atmosphere today. One half of the total has caused atmospheric CO2 rise and the other half has been absorbed in the ocean and in vegetation. Now, CO2 and other greenhouse gases reduce the amount of outgoing heat. Meanwhile, incoming solar radiation is relatively constant and as a result we are causing a shift in the climate. Think of it as a bathtub, in which the filling tap stays the same, but the outflow gets partially blocked. Because the balance between inflow and outflow is disturbed, the water level in the bath rises. Now, in a similar way, constant incoming radiation and partial blocking of outgoing radiation causes an increase in the global average temperature. Now we get to the big question. What can we do to repair this imbalance in the climate? Well, global climate change proves that we do have the power to change the Earth system. That's beyond question, we've done it. So what we now need to do is to take responsibility, use that power and restore the climate. First, we could try to make the planet more reflective to sunlight. There are some suggestions on how to do this, and these fall often under the name of geoengineering. There are many open questions about this and especially about the safety of this approach. So I will not further delve into this topic. Second, we can reduce greenhouse gas levels. There is a lot of activity around emissions reduction already, including a move to electric cars, to more eco-friendly houses, a development of renewable energy sources, and so on. But at best, this might bring about emissions to zero. But nations are aiming at net zero emissions at some point in the future. Will that be enough? Well, unfortunately, the answer there has to be no. Uh, we've already emitted too much CO2 and other greenhouse gases, and they have already caused more than 1.1 degrees C of global average warming. And what's worse, some of the components of our climate system take many centuries to fully respond. And key examples of this, for example, are ocean warming and continental ice sheet melting. So these systems are not yet fully adjusted to our emissions up to now, and once they play out fully, warming will reach one and a half to two and a half degrees C. Clearly, we are already at or above the warming limits of the Paris Climate Agreement. If we consider things from a long-term long perspective, that is. And there is a very important message in this. It is that even if we completely stopped emissions from today, this delayed warming would still continue, while the slow systems are catching up with what has been emitted already until today. 
And because we won't stop emissions from today, it will only get worse. Most nations are talking of reaching net zero emissions as late as 2030 or 20, 2050. So in short, there is no doubt. We must stop emissions as soon as possible and we must find ways to actively remove greenhouse gases from the climate system. Most importantly, the main one, CO2. CO2 removal is possible on small scales. We do it already in space capsules and space stations and in submarines. Remember that improvised CO2 scrubber in the film Apollo 13? Well, that's exactly what we're talking about, but then on truly massive scales. We need to remove between 70 and 280 billion tons of carbon by 2100. You need to multiply that by about four to get the mass of CO2. This means almost 10 to 35 billion tons of carbon removal per year. And for scale, our emissions are about 10 billion tons of carbon per year. I'm not going to lie to you, it's a gigantic task. To have a chance of success, we must activate every single reasonable process that can contribute. And we must do so while making dramatic emissions reductions at the same time. Otherwise, we'd have to remove even more carbon. This is arguably humanity's greatest challenge yet, but humanity has excelled before at facing massive challenges. It will be costly, but the costs of climate change impacts if we do nothing are actually projected to be higher. So what are our options? There are three main streams of possibilities. First, we have the Earth system based methods on land. Earth system methods employ processes of carbon removal that exist already in natural form and then artificially speed them up. Here we find such approaches as the more familiar ones, massive tree planting or reforestation, restoring carbon levels in degraded soils all around the world, burial of charcoal-like products called biochar, artificially accelerated weathering of rocks which consume CO2 or the use uh, of captured carbon to make long-lasting products such as building materials. Second, there are marine earth system methods. So, and, and, and among these, they're a bit more unfamiliar, but we have artificial fertilization of ocean areas to trigger algal blooms, which then sink into the deep sea when they die. And there, at least theoretically, the carbon is locked away for thousands of years. Then there's restoration and enrichment of coastal ecosystems, which can hold vast quantities of carbon. And we could add lime to the oceans or other so-called so alkaline products to combat ocean acidification. And this might be done together with seawater electrolysis to drive a hydrogen fuel based economy. Third, then we have the land based technologies to remove carbon from the atmosphere. Here, examples include biofuel-based energy generation with CO2 capture at the smokestack and subsequent burial of that CO2, or direct capture of CO2 from the open air linked with burial of that CO2. There are also marine technological approaches being investigated, but it's still too early to get into those. They're very immature still. If you add the potential of all these methods together, then it reaches between 4 and 40 billion tons of potential carbon removal per year. And as we saw before, the target is 10 to 35 billion tons of carbon removal per year. So we might just about be able to meet the challenge, but only if we put our shoulders under it. Critically, it will only be enough if we massively reduce emissions at the same time. To press that point a little, we can only succeed if we follow a combined approach of drastic emission reductions and rapid development of all reasonable carbon drawdown methods. And we need to keep an open mind. And we need to be ready to optimize and include any new ideas that may come along. And finally, I emphasize that many of the carbon drawdown methods are particularly interesting because they have good potential to pay for themselves. And this is because there are, ad there are additional benefits. And for example, these include improvements in soil quality and therefore food production and associated food security. 
or improvements in coastal ecosystems which benefit with benefits for fisheries and for protection against coastal erosion and flooding or availability of next generation building materials or even driving a more sustainable circular economy that's based on recycling. So to conclude, it is still possible to avert the worst of climate change, not everything, but the worst of it. And the time to act, if we want to accomplish it, is now. You know that future that people always talk about, about when they're discussing climate action? Well, that future starts today, right here, right now. Otherwise, we are too late. Together, we can still make it happen. Thank you.